there's a lot of different things they do on that. But this right here is a little uh, rundown on your emission stuff. I'll talk some about monitors and whatnot. Uh, but I want to hit you guys to start with with this. Uh, the vehicles pr produce uh, three harmful gases and two harmless beneficial gases. What are the three harmful three? Where's carbon everybody dioxide, else? Carbon dioxide. I, I got the other guy there. I do other stuff, but this is a huh? uh, You got, uh, what'd you say? Hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and yeah. oxides of nitrogen, right? Yeah. Which was, it's, I mean, if it's, uh, it's, you know, it's oxides of nitrogen, NOx gas, what they call it. I think carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and different things. Absolutely. Carbon dioxide is two molecules of oxygen, carbon monoxide is one. And the reason carbon monoxide happens is because you've got a mixture that's running a little bit too rich. Okay. What's the abbreviation? So it would be... It's hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and oxides of nitrogen. Carbon dioxide is not... Carbon dioxide is not a problem. Now they're trying to act like it is, but it's not. And a lot of, like I said, the, why the reason the grass grows so much beside the road and they got to cut it with those mowers is because it's just soaking up this carbon dioxide out of the cars and loving it. Because grass and trees and stuff love carbon dioxide, because that's what we breathe out. And if I'm building a car that breathes out the same thing I breathe out, I'm thinking that's not a problem. Don't you? If, if your animals and us and all breathe out carbon dioxide, and the car's breathing it out. As a matter of fact, one of those newer uh, power stroke diesels has got a particulate filter on it. And if you drive through downtown Los Angeles on one of those vehicles, the air that's coming out of the tailpipe is cleaner than what it's drinking in. It's cleaning the air as it goes through town, and it's a diesel. Okay, so anyway, what are the harmless and beneficial two are CO2 and water vapor. CO2 and water vapor are your harmless gases that are beneficial. Now, what gas does the exhaust gas recirculation system control? Gas? Yeah, which one of the harmful three does it control? I'm going to say hydrocarbons. No, it doesn't have anything to do with hydrocarbons. What is, it, what is it actually doing? It's recircling exhaust gas from all the way back to the intake. And, it, and, it, and what and does that do? What does that do on the business end of things? It lets it reburn it. Yeah. Does it reburn it? It actually is putting some gas in there that won't burn. When I was working down on the coast and these guys had some gasoline barrels or barrels that had flammable stuff in them and they wanted to cut it with their torch, what they would do is take the exhaust pipe off of their vehicle or they'd actually put a hose on the exhaust pipe and run it in that barrel, in that big hole in that barrel, and let the car run and put that uh, inert gas in there that was coming out of the exhaust. And then they could just use the torch to cut that barrel open. It didn't matter because was all the vapors that would explode were burnt, pushed out by that inert gas. So if you put inert gas in there and it takes up some of the room, the combustion chamber is going to be cooler. And if it's cooler, you're not making oxides of nitrogen because oxides of nitrogen is made over 2,500 degrees. So if you want to keep it below that. That's what that's what EGR is for. The catalyst takes care of it too. You know, the catalyst actually wants some. If any oxides of nitrogen is made, the catalyst breaks it apart into nit oxygen and nitrogen, which is what our air is out here. So it's not reburning anything. A lot. Of, I mean, a lot of people say that it reburns. Well, it's not reburning it. It's just taking it, and running it in there, so it will lower the temperature of the combustion chamber. Just remember that, because I'm going to be asking you, I'm going to be giving you a verbal final exam on emissions, and you can't fumble your way through it. You need to give me good answers, or you're going to miss the question. Uh, the, the exhaust, the EGR system controls NOx. And on, a, on a diesel like Matt works on, they actually want the EGR, the exhaust gas to be 800 degrees cooler when it goes into the intake than it is when it leaves the exhaust. So they got temperature sensors on both ends of that and it goes through two coolers. Yeah, I know, they do. But you, you, you can't, you're not supposed to do that. It's really against federal law to do that. And uh, if you got to watch the feds because if they decide they want to drum up some money, they're going to come and find all these people that have done that and hit them with big fines. So I'm not taking any emission control stuff off mine. You know, you're not beating the route when you do that. If you're, and if you ever happen to cut through the corner of California and they catch you with emission controls that have been modified, you've lost your car until they, you get it put back like it was supposed to be. So be careful with that. Anyway, the optimum air fuel mixture is for the cleanest burn is what? Like 14.2 or something like that. 14.7 to 1. Remember that number. 14. Now it's going to change if you've got alcohol fuel and all that hot wash, but 
pretty much stoichiometry is 14.7. When you hear that, you see that word, stoichiometry, stoichiometry. Uh, why was it necessary to remove lead from gasoline in the early 1970s? No. What was the lead in there to begin with for? For the motor. For the valves. Yeah. It would coat the valves and make them seal better. I mean, that lead and that, a lot of them, you know, you might have seen all the stickers on the older gas pump contains lead. Well, that lead actually helps to lubricate and coat the surfaces on the inside of the engine. They get last one. I knew now, that, but I didn't know that's what you were asking. Oh, that's what I'm asking. But the reason, now wait a minute, back up. They took it out because the catalytic converter strata would get coated by lead and it wouldn't work. So if you put leaded fuel in one that's got a catalytic converter, you destroy the catalytic converter. So when I said it, killing oxygen. Well, the oxygen sensor is not the primary concern. The oxygen agree. sensor can be killed by that, but it can also be killed by silicone or just about anything else. If you've blown a head gasket and you've got an exhaust system full of antifreeze, well, you better be selling them some O2 sensors too because they're probably going to need them. Because the antifreeze has got silicone in it, coolant does, and it'll coat that ceramic zirconia and they won't work. But um, the other end of it is you're, you're concerned about the catalytic converter. A lot of what your computer is doing is all about the catalytic converter because the catalytic converter is super expensive. And your engine control unit is more concerned about that than it is anything else. That's why the, uh, con cat the uh, catalyst monitor uh, part of the system will, ba will basically uh, protect the catalytic converter by changing the fuel trim. If that aft, if the one, the HO2 sensor 1, 2, 2, 2, if they are messing, if they have a screwed up signal, it can affect your fuel trim. And most people don't even think about those sensors back there, but they can, they can screw up your fuel trim. Okay, what emission does the, which one of the three gases, the big three, the, the dirty three, does the vehicle, does the evaporative system control? Hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons. It basically is going to absorb those into its little carbon fibers, and then it's going to purge them out of there when the PCM decides to start operating them. Like, oh, incidentally, I wanted to back up and tell you that the gas, uh, the unleaded gas, the, the, the leaded gas had a bigger pump nozzle that wouldn't go down in the little, you know, the little hole with your little gate? It wouldn't even go down in there. And so people weren't, you know, not need to do that. Uh, black smoke from the exhaust is a strong indicator of what? Rich. Which would be what kind of emissions? Not just rich. I mean, what, which, which, is, which are the big three? Which of the ugly three? Hydrocarbons. hydrocarbons. That's right. You see so on your spark plugs. That's hydrocarbon fouling. What actually happens at the molecular level when fuel burns in the combustion chamber? At the molecular level. Well, I don't, I don't understand what you're asking. I just put it at the molecule mix and change. I don't know <laughs> what you're asking. Oxygen unites with carbon. Yeah, and it basically oxygen accelerates combustion, but whenever uh, oxygen is actually getting together with the carbon, it's burning. That's what's going on there, but that's why you put hydrocarbons and air in there, and you get carbon dioxide out, and water, vapor, and all that. Remember, you're making a gallon of water for every gallon of gas. You know, so basically, you got that. Yeah, so uh, anyway, the, uh, the fuel unites with the oxygen, gives off heat, and expands while it's doing it. What else, what do you, have you ever seen anything oxidize? What's something look like when it oxidizes? Tell me the last thing you saw that oxidized. Say I'm side my trunk. What about rusty steel? That's what I was saying, I'm side my trunk. Yeah, that's rusty. I mean, that's, ox what about the paint, that's that old ugly uh, paint that you got on your truck? It's where the clear coat's coming off? It's oxidizing, you know what I mean? I mean, I've got all the bumper on my car. The clear coat's coming off and it's trying to oxidize. Once you wet sand it and recook. Huh? Once you wet sand it and Yeah, I probably could, but I'm not that concerned about it. That's my work car. Um, but anyway, uh, and the term stoichiometric means what? Which is the 14.71, right? Does alcohol produce more power and fuel economy than gasoline? No. Less fuel economy and power and gasoline. There's not as much energy in gasoline as, I mean, in alcohol as there is in gasoline. How do they make so much power on that alcohol? 
Well, they got those things set up to run their mix really rich. If you're, ch that's why these uh, E85 vehicles are set up so that they have to alter the uh, fuel mix and the gas and the fuel economy goes down. You won't get as many miles per gallon off that. But now you're talking about top fuel dragsters. They turn that that thing only turns 900 RPM when it's going through its whole length of a mile. I mean, from the time they start until the time they get out of it, they've been turning 1,000 RPM. And each cylinder has got as much horsepower as a NASCAR engine on one of those top fuel tractors. Eight, nine, ten thousand horsepower. And a NASCAR engine has got like 1,500, you know, or something like that, you know. So, what do they do to it to make it? They basically put lots and lots of juice in there. It burns 20 gallons of alcohol in 900 RPM. From the time it got starts until the time it hits the end, it had burned 20 gallons of fuel. Well, why don't they just do that with gas? If it's not as explosive? I don't know. I have, I'm not a top fuel dragster expert, but I mean, I know some of the basic facts and figures, but, you know, why do they put nitrogen in the tires on NASCAR vehicles? Because it don't expand. Huh? Oh, oh, they don't expand, air. that's right. And it also, they're not as worried about it oxidizing the rubber that's, that's as they are about it changing temperature, well, and pressure say, changing with temperature. They say it's the lighter than air, too. Well, it's a little bit. Oxygen, the, the atomic weight of nitrogen is 14 and oxygen 16. But it ain't that much, but they don't want it changing. They want the pressure to stay the same. And if you put dry nitrogen in there, it doesn't expand. And you put air in it, it gets hot and it expands. Yeah, I know, yeah, that's why your cars do that, you know. Uh, during a combustion event, why does the ignition spark burn out while energy is still available at the ignition coil? You know how you've got this, you got your firing line, you got your little spark line, and then it kicks up, and then it's got these little squiggles? The reason it kicks up is because it uses up all the gas, right? In other words, when the gas is used up, it burns out, and the spark goes away. Because the gas is conductive, and whenever all of the conductiveness is gone, and if you notice it's changing, it's actually getting more and more resistance, and when the gas is gone, you wind up with a reserve energy squiggle. Um, if the engine is running too hot, which harmful gas increases? Carbon dioxide, carbon oxide. No, oxides of nitrogen because of the higher cylinder temperatures. I mean, you see what you could, you're supposed to correlate that earlier, right? And if an engine's running too cold, what increases? There's two of them that increase when it's running too cold. Hydrocarbons. And? Uh, hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons. Yeah. 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 If it's running just a little bit rich, which gas increases? Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide increases because every, uh, what I always like to say is every molecule of carbon wants to get married to two molecules of oxygen to make carbon dioxide. If it's a little bit too rich, it only gets one. If it's really rich, it don't get none, and that's when you get your soot. Now carbon monoxide, you can't smell it, you can't see it, but it will kill you. Seriously, it will. I mean, you shall surely die. If you're breathing in bad air, you just keel over, hit the ground, never saw it, you know, never saw it coming. Probably one of those. Makes you start going sleepy. Yeah, you just poof, you just go away, you know. Of course, these newer cars with the carbon dioxide. I heard about some guy that sued GM because he closed his garage door and cranked the car up and ran a whole tank of gas out of his car and woke up with a bad headache about eight hours later. Didn't kill him. He thought he was trying to commit suicide and it wouldn't kill him. You know, it wouldn't kill that guy's chickens in the chicken house when it he packed his 2003 F-150 in there, cranked it up, and tried to kill 10,000 chickens, and they were just running around having a big time. You know. <laughs> Ran a bunch of gas in there. But anyway, all right, let me ask you this. What's PCV and why do we need it? Uh, ventilate the crankcase. Ventilate the crankcase. Why do we need to ventilate the crankcase? Not pressure to build up in there and blow the seals out. Where does the pressure come from? No, blow by on the rings. Did you catch that? Did you hear what he said? Blow by on the ring. You don't have a perfect seal between the piston rings and the cylinder. You got an almost perfect seal. Some of it's going to go by the ring, the end of the ring. Some of it's going to go, you're going to get some down there, basically. And your PCV system is going to be purging all of that pressure out all the time. If you have a crankcase that's totally sealed, it blows all the seals and all just goes everywhere. Early on, they just put a draft tube on there that had a sort of an angular cut. So when you were going down the road, 
an air of a V going past a vehicle and just pull that on out of the crankcase and just keep it. But then they started saying, well, we need to do something to keep that out of the air because these traffic cops that had to do this in the cities, you know, and all, started burning their eyes and it was just all over. So they started recycling it through there and getting it to where the PCV would pull it into the crankcase and it would have a half vent on the other side coming from the breather, which is metered air on the ones that have mass airflow. It'll have it coming out of that hose. But they want good clean air going in there. If your crankcase breather is dirty or missing or the hose is unhooked, you're pulling dirt into your crankcase. So make darn sure that system is good and sealed. Right? So it takes what's in the crankcase, pulls it back into the motor? Yeah, pulls it right on in there and processes it. Goes out the back, it's processed with everything else. Let me ask you this. Uh, why don't they put, why do, I mean, why do they have rings that got a gap in it? Like, why, why wouldn't they have come up with something that doesn't have a gap? But, um, it would be too hard. And they wouldn't expand. Yeah. It's got to have, yeah. Whenever it heats up, it's got to have a little room to expand, too. I mean, it's just not, there's, I mean, it's not, there's not any good way you could put a seal in there that would do any better than rings. Now, they do have low tension piston rings that are really thin. That, and on those engines, if the cylinder walls get washed down, it goes, yeah, like any kind of compression. Well, on the, the engines, like these old 302s and 350s and all, if those cylinder walls get washed down, they go, rrr, 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 rrr. you ever heard one crank? I mean, it makes you wonder, what the heck's wrong with this? You know, and after you run it a while, and the cylinder walls are nice and lubricated, you know, fire up and run like it ought to. But when you have one sitting there and the cylinder walls have gone dry, they, oh, they, don't, they just turn so slow, you know. Oh, anyway, we used to have to hook them up 24 volts to get them to spin up fast enough to fire up, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway, we're also looking at, now EGR, tell me a bit about EGR again. We need EGR for what? Say it back to me, come on. Low intensity. We're recirculating exhaust gas. We put inert gas in there. Now, on some of the ones that closed the exhaust valves earlier, they just leave some of that in there, like on the old contours and some of the other ones. There's a bunch of different reasons they do valve, you know, dynamic valve time. Okay, so let me ask you this. What about your uh, your oxygen sensors? What do they do? They provide what? I read how much oxygen is going through there. And I tell the computer that they need to run later. Feedback. Basically, see my watch? This watch right here is just a plain old Swiss Army wristwatch. It doesn't know if it's right or wrong. Now they do make Swiss Army wrist, or that, not Swiss Army, they do make wristwatches that are atomic. And they're taught, they get feedback from the atomic clock system so that they'll set their cells. You know them clocks that set their cells? That's a closed loop. So the oxygen sensors are closed loop between the PCM and what has happened. And so if it sees that it's running rich, it takes some fuel away. If it sees it's running lean, it adds some fuel. That's what a closed loop is all about. If it's, not, if it's ignoring the oxygen sensor, like when the engine's cold or when you're at wide open throttle or anything else that's going on, that's open loop. So know the difference between open and closed loop fuel control, okay? Know the difference. All right. All right. So these are your monitors. There's a catalyst efficiency monitor that you have to be driving a certain distance, you know, certain temperature on the catalyst and all that to get that. Misfire detection, that's with your cam sensor. You got the, on the Chrysler products, you got what they call an adaptive numerator, but all of them do it. What they're basically looking for, when you're letting off the gas and you're coasting and there's not any load being pulled, they're looking at that nice even wave and it remembers that. And when it's misfiring, some of those waves will be farther apart on the one that's misfiring, and that's how it knows which cylinder is misfiring because it can look at the cam sensor and the crank sensor and tell, aha, it's slowing down when cylinder number three is supposed to be firing, and it throws you a PO303. Evaporative emission system monitor on those is basically you're going to stop up the vent, you're going to pull the uh, air out of the tank, you're going to see if it holds so many inches of water, uh, which water and mercury is two different vacuum readings. Water's a lot weaker. Uh, you know how it is. You know the ones that we see the P, the codes that we do the smoke test because we've got an evaporative leak. Secondary air injection system monitor. If it puts air upstream, it wants to see the oxygen sensors reflect that. You got me? So it's got to watch that. This is all OBD2 stuff. They didn't yeah, have it. They only do that with like an air pump. Right? If it's got an air pump, but a lot of vehicles nowadays have got electric air pumps on them. Not every vehicle has an air mon I mean air injection reactor or air pump system. Some of them do, some of them don't. It's more common than you think, though. Would mine have it? Um, 
it may have, it may not. You need to investigate. I know that on that green GMC, they may make it both ways, depending on whatever. All right, fuel system monitor is basically looking at your fuel trims, right? Basically seeing if your fuel trims are out of balance one way short and long fuel trims. You everybody understand, you understand fuel trims? When your oxygen sensor is telling it, let's say your oxygen sensor goes up and it's telling it it's rich, fuel trim starts to go down to try to pull that oxygen sensor down. You know, imagine yourself pulling one way or another with a rope. If it, whoa, it's going up, let's pull it back down. Whoa, it's going down, let's pull it back up. You're the fuel trim. That's what it does. And when a short fuel trim maxes out, like if the short fuel trim subtracted 25 or 30 percent and it's hit as far as it can go, the long fuel trim starts making course adjustments so that the short fuel trim can come back to zero. And so the short fuel trim happens instantaneously. The long fuel trim happens over time if the short fuel trim gets in deep water where it can do it. Um, there's your heated oxygen sensor monitor. It wants to know how much current each one of the heaters is pulling. And the oxygen sensor, if you got one that's not pulling any current, like the heater's burned out or you got a bad connection, you got issues there. Or if it's a dead short. Exhaust gas recirculation system monitor. They have a bunch of different ways of doing that. They can check it with the MAP sensor. They can check it with the DPFE sensor on the forwards. They can check it with the temperature of the, they'll have a little temperature sensor right there in the EVR valve. So if it's flowing, if it's not flowing because it's got a clogged up passage, it's going to toss you a PO401 code. They need to know if it's flowing because if it has gone south because of all of the PCB steam, you know, whenever you shut off the car, there's all this oil steam that goes up in the intake through the PCB system and all. And it just settles around in there and it gets on the back of the throttle plate and it, on the GDI vehicles it gets on the valves and you know it's worse whenever you drive short distances and, or use crummy uh, oil and gas. Uh, comprehensive components monitor is basically looking there at all of the sensors that are producing voltage, your engine coolant, your intake air, your map, all of them. If it sees one of those go out of line, there are such things as in range failures. Or it will stay, it will be within the range that it's permitted, and it'll be causing problems, but it won't throw a code. Now sometimes they'll have a rationality check where they'll say, if I see this, then I should see that, and this is telling me that that should look different. And, you know, it, basically these they're pretty smart about how they do that. Anyway, that's what that comprehensive components monitor is. It's basically all the time watching those voltages. You don't have to wait until you've been driving at a certain amount of time and everything's a certain temperature like you do on the catalyst monitor. Uh, the thermostat monitor, you've seen the PO128 and the PO125 telling you the thermostat. Remember, there are times when the PO125 on some vehicles means you've got a bad oxygen sensor. Because if the oxygen sensor never starts switching, uh, some of the Toyotas will act like, hey, it's running too cold because the oxygen sensor never woke up. So if you've got an oxygen sensor heater that's not, you know, heating up or whatever, usually, like 99% of the time that I've ever seen a PO125 or a PO128 is the thermostat. But if somebody says, I've replaced my thermostat a bunch of times, the engine seems to be running normal temperature, I'm still getting a PO125, start thinking you may be looking at an oxygen sensor issue. I don't tell you those. Huh? I don't tell you those. Yeah, that's on like my, uh, my son's Toyota Camry, the 98 Camry that's like the engine we got on the stand, it did that. It threw a PO125 and it was because he had some wires that were broke going to his oxygen sensor. And it had nothing to do with the thermostat. Everybody was just phone about that. Uh, the catalyst efficiency monitor uses an oxygen sensor before and after the catalyst. It's one to know if it's got sufficient storage capacity. Oxygen. Now, remember, you, if you're going to fix a PO420 or a PO430 code, a, a contaminated catalyst can also make it through that. So sometimes you can clean the catalyst out you know, by running it clean and doing other things. But anyway, uh, in order to access it, it counts front and rear O2 switches. Your rear oxygen sensor should go slow. Your front one should go fast. If the front one's going fast and the back one's going slow, it's like an automobile. And it's happy. Misfire detection monitor. Acceleration that a piston undergoes during a normal firing event is directly related to the amount of torque that cylinders produce. The calculated piston cylinder acceleration values are compared to a misfire threshold that's continuously adjusted based on inferring engine torque. Uh, they actually have uh, got a, uh, uh, on these GM cars, they can actually determine if you're riding on a rough road. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Deviant accelerations exceeding the threshold are conditionally labeled as misfires. 
because of that. All right. And so normally it results in a non-symmetrical loss of cylinder acceleration. So mechanical noise like rough roads or high RPM light load condition will produce symmetrical acceleration variations, and so they have to know that. And so noise-free deviant acceleration exceeding a given threshold is labeled a misfire. And once again, it sets the standard for that when you're decelerating. Ooh, and it's, it's, it knows you've let off the gas because it knows what you're doing with the gas. It knows you're losing speed. It knows you've let off the gas. It knows you're coasting. It knows you're basically engines being driven by the transmission and the wheels and the momentum of the car. And it knows that's going to be a nice even. Like I say, if you hear the words, Chrysler likes to call that the adaptive numerator. But they're the only ones that call them that. Crank learners, is what I'm call it, I think. Uh, this fire rate's evaluated every 200 revolution period. That's the one that exceed the PCM program there. That's a type A misfire. If it's misfired more than every 200 revolutions, that is a heavy misfire. <laughs> you know? uh, steady. Uh, that's the one to prevent damage to the catalytic converter. That's why it's flashing. It flashes on that. All right, if the misfire threshold is exceeded, and the catalyst temperature model calculates the catalyst mid-bed temperature that exceeds the catalyst damage threshold. The mill blinks one hertz, that's one time per second uh, rate. And you got your profile correction software to learn and correct for mechanical inaccuracy for the crank. Yeah, that's what I was talking about when it lets off. When you let off, it actually stores what's normal when it's not pulling anything. They're learned during closed throttle line breaking defuel acceleration. Defuel meaning what? It turns off the injector off the gas. Remember the old algorithm I told you about where it said that a calculated pulse width less than 1.2 milliseconds and an engine speed greater than 1200 RPM, the injectors are turned off. That's when you're letting off. If, you're, if you can watch your injectors, you'll see those things shut down when you're coasting. Why put gas in there when you don't need it? The carburetor puts it in there all the time. It just keeps on pumping. Since inaccuracies in the wheel tooth spacing can produce a false indication of a misfire, the misfire monitor is not active until the corrections are learned. So until it knows what the normal profile is, it's not even going to pay attention. Because it doesn't have anything to compare it to. It's like a blank screen. And it says, well, I see stuff going on over here, but I don't know what's right, so I'm just not going to say anything about it. And now whenever it gets a good snapshot, it says, aha! I've got a good snapshot now on this screen. I see the, what was actually going on and that. I see what it's supposed to look like. At this particular engine speed, this thing ought to look like that. How it does it. Uh, and then so basically, if the software is unable to learn a profile after 254 attempts, the PO315 DTC is set. And that's not. All right. There's your misfire detection thing. Your high data rate misfire system. See, it's looking at that. It's basically looking at your EDI. This is this is Ford stuff here, and there's your processor EDIS with the what uh, electronic distributed emission system, which is what the S4 got. But anyway, that's what you're looking at right there. Vehicles that meet enhanced evaporative requirements utilize a vacuum-based evaporative system integrity check, and basically what that does. And there, there used to be some lesser versions of that that weren't enhanced, but now just about everybody's got enhanced. They've got strange ways of doing this that you wouldn't think about. Natural vacuum leak detection, NVLD, where they'll actually, when you shut the car off, they expect the gas to shrink and the pressure to drop in the tank. And if it doesn't, they know there's a leak. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the ways that they do it, NVLD, they call it. Uh, but you got your canister vent solenoid, which that's the one on the downstream of the canister when it closes. And basically, you remember you close that one when you're doing your smoke test, so the smoke won't come scooping out there, and all that. Paper management valve find a 20,000 diameter larger evaporator system leak. If you put that uh, thing on the 20,000s and look and see where the little balls float, that'll show you what a 20,000 leak looks like. Uh, the evaporator system integrity test is done under a condition that minimize vapor generation and fuel tank pressure changes. Now, you remember what I told you, too. It won't check it if it's, unless it's between 15 and 85 percent. Somebody runs their gas tank almost empty all the time, they won't ever get an evaporative system test. Or if they always keep it full, like my wife, you know, she, whenever she gets down to about an eighth of the tank, she wants it to top back up, you know. And <laughs> she don't get a lot of evaporative tests on hers, you know. But the check is right after a six-hour cold engine soak, uh, engine off timer during steady highway speeds at ambient temperature, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, they're different. It's basically different on every car. 
we're almost at the point where we're going to stop here and say this is a little criterion that it has 